All right, so we know that moving charges generate magnetic fields, but we did not, as of yet, write down quantitatively how you calculate that magnetic field. So we want to do that this week. Um, now we'll start with an expression um, for the magnetic field due to a single moving charge. And so if I imagine a single point charge with value Q moving at a velocity V, uh, it turns out you can write the magnetic field created by that object in the following way. And so um, the magnetic field is B uh, is equal to mu naught over 4 pi. Now mu naught is a constant that's called the permeability of free space. Um, it's merely there to make sure that you, if you use SI units for the other quantities, you get magnetic field in Tesla. It's really just to convert units. That's all it's, it's there for. Um, and Q times V cross R hat over R squared. All right, now I need to define what r hat and r squared are. So it turns out, um, if you have your moving point charge here, r hat is the unit vector that points to the location that you're observing. So you're measuring the magnetic field at this location, b of r. Um, and what I should do is just say r vector. OK, let me fix that. There we go. r vector points from the location of the point charge to the observing location. And r hat is just the unit vector that points in the same direction. So, it, I mean, formally speaking, r hat is just the magnitude of the vector r divided by its magnitude. Okay. All right. Now, it turns out this expression that we write down here um, is only valid in certain limits. So, it's valid when the, the speed of the particle is far below the speed of light. It's valid if the particle has been moving steadily for, for a long time, for really for infinite time. Okay, because it turns out uh, as you accelerate a particle, there's all kinds of different behaviors. You get generation of radiation and so forth and so on. Some of this we'll talk about later in the quarter. Okay, so this expression um, is valid only in the case, in very specific cases. Okay, all right. I mean, I, I actually don't like that the book uses it at this point because, it, again, it's a very special circumstance that applies. However, I introduce it because it's useful now to develop the expressions for magnetic field generation by uh, currents and wires and, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, now, I should say uh, two things, two more things. Uh, first of all, this expression that you see um, and expressions like it for the magnetic field of a wire were developed empirically. That means that people made measurements of the forces between uh, you know, two current carrying wires and deduced that the magnetic field strength falls off as 1 over r squared from a little bit of current, okay, which is this here. Okay? Um, the second thing to, to remind you of is that the magnetic field always circles currents or circles moving charges in a right-hand sense. And so you can, uh, the, the structure of this uh, magnetic field um, is that it circles around the charge as it moves. Let me make a drawing down here, I think. So here's my moving charge. The magnetic field will circle in a right-hand sense, so there'll basically be little circles of magnetic field that uh, move around like this. Now, you know, it, it should be pointed out that the magnetic field falls off with distance. So it goes off as 1 over r squared, but it's not as if the, you know, if I draw these field lines, that's all there is to the magnetic field. The magnetic field exists everywhere in space. So the, this charged particle, as it moves, generates a magnetic field that fills all of space. Okay, I'm just drawing a few field lines here. If I drew more of them, they might circle around like this, um, but they fall off with distance. Okay. All right, so what I want to do now, so this, this expression um, for the magnetic field generated by uh, a single moving point charge, uh, again, it's not so useful, okay? So we're not going to use it very often. Instead, mostly because it's very restricted where it's valid, uh, as I mentioned. Um, but it gives us a useful starting point to, to discuss the magnetic field generated by uh, a, a set of charges moving steadily in a wire, okay, for example, or a set of charges moving steadily uh, on a sheet of metal, okay, or a set of charges moving steadily throughout a volume, okay, so if you look inside of a wire. Um, so let's talk about those situations. Taking this as granted, okay, this expression for the magnetic field of a single point charge moving, um, let me go to the next page. Well, yeah, I'll go to the next page, all right. 
So let's consider first, imagine I have a wire, okay? And let me give myself some more room here. So I have a wire, and there's a current I that flows through that wire. Now I'm going to calculate the magnetic field generated by this wire at this location. Now I have to set I, I have to set up a coordinate system to do this calculation. I'm going to define my origin to be here. It's completely arbitrary. You can pick your origin wherever you want to. Okay? I'm going to put it right there, and then I'm going to find the location that I'm measuring the magnetic field to be R. Okay? From the origin. And what I'm going to do is consider the contributions to the magnetic field for moving charges that move all along the wire. So let me just pick a little section of the wire that has length dl, okay? And I'm going to locate that section with a vector r prime from the origin, okay? And then there's a vector here that points from the little section of moving charges to the observing location. I'm going to call that big R. And that big R is defined formally as R minus R prime. Okay. Now let me, um, so what we're going to do now is think about this little section of the wire as a bit of moving charge. And we're going to use this expression from before. Okay, so I'll go back to this expression very quickly. Um, now just to make sure that, I can't remember if I said this, um, this, this vector R, okay, that I defined over here um, uh, changes with time in this scenario. Okay, so it turns out as the charge moves in space, um, this vector r also changes. So if I look a little bit later in time, say the charge is over here, now the location of my observing uh, point, if it hasn't moved, it has a new vector. Okay that's defined like that. Okay, so that's another limitation of this expression um, is that the vector r depends on the location of the charge and that's going to change with time. Okay, now however in the case of this wire, let me go back to my next page here, in the case of this wire um, I, I always have charge at this location moving with some velocity. Okay, that's a, I have a steady current. So as charge moves through that location, a new charge comes in moving at the same speed as the previous charge was. And so I can think about this vector r as being stationary, that I always have moving charge there contributing in the same way all the time. Okay? And so for that reason, um, I can do this calculation ignoring um, the fact that the charge that sits here at one location at one point in time is going to move on and new charge is going to replace it. So I can use this um, formula from before. I need to find what QV is for this wire to plug it into that expression. What I'm going to look for, I'm going to define a little bit of charge, dQ, <clears throat> that's in this location. Uh, you know, this location here has length dL. And I'm going to do that by saying, well, I know that um, the, 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 char the, the wire is overall neutral, right? So there's equal amounts of positive and negative charges. It just turns out that, say, the negative charges are moving in a way that generates a current, okay? So I can think about the density, the, the amount of negative charge at this location. And I can define it as the density of charge. This is going to be the line density, the number of electrons per unit length along the wire. Okay, or the number of protons per unit length along the wire. So lambda times the little bit of length, dl. Okay, that's going to be my charge, uh, my little bit of charge dq. Now the velocity that these charges move will be the drift velocity associated with the current in the wire. So I can write down that my um, little bit of magnetic field generated by this uh, segment dl can be written as mu naught over 4 pi times now QV is going to become DQ times V, and that's going to be lambda DL, that's the little bit of negative charge in that location. Okay, now as I write this, I'm treating it as if it's positive charge moving, but you know, basically the drift velocity and the sign of the charge work together so that the current's always in the direction shown. Okay, so this is the same as Q times V, it's DQ times the velocity now times r hat over r squared. 
Okay, and so I can rewrite this one more time by noticing that um, lambda times V drift is the same as the current flowing in the wire. Okay, so this is the, I mean, you can argue it from a dimensional point of view. So this is the number of charges per unit length. This is uh, distance per time, okay, or the amount of um, distance you move for a certain set of, uh, certain uh, uh, passage of time. Um, so if I multiply those two together, what I get is charge per unit time, okay, which is the same as the current. And so I'll assert that these two are the same thing. Um, what I'll do is I'll give the vector that's on the drift velocity to dl. And so I can rewrite this as db vector is mu naught over 4 pi um, i dl cross r hat over r squared. Okay, that's the little bit of magnetic field provided by that small segment of the wire. Okay, and again I can connect it back to this expression for the field generated by a single moving point charge. Okay, which as far as you're concerned came out of nowhere. Okay, but it it is an expression that um, again was derived empirically. All right, now this is the little bit of the wire. It gives me that little bit of magnetic field to get the total field <clears throat> due to this segment of wire. So I have my segment of wire you know, defined by its endpoints. Usually it'll be a closed wire, but I can consider the, f the field generated by this wire carrying current I at this location. Okay, so the magnetic field generated will be due to contributions from all along the wire. <clears throat> and so what I need to do is integrate all along the wire. So the magnetic field at location R will be the integral now of this expression, mu naught over 4 pi I dl cross R hat over R squared. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. And so the limits of the integral are set by the, you know, how much of the wire I want to calculate the field generated by. Okay. Um, I'll give an example in the next video, and you'll get many examples. You'll get one in discussion too. Okay. All right, so I want to, before I end this video and do examples, um, I want to generalize this expression. So it turns out that, um, so this is for a wire. I could also consider, um, you know, also consider a wire, but now let me look inside the wire. So it turns out that um, really inside the wire, it's not infinitely thin. There's some finite extent of the wire, and you can consider a you know a little block of electrons so there's electrons everywhere in this wire that are moving with some drift speed v drift okay that's what's carrying the current um, and i can consider um, in this case my little dq will be the charge density rho per unit volume the number of electrons per, per unit volume times their charge um, times the volume element dv. So dv will be the volume of this little cube here. Um, and again, the charges move with v-drift. Okay. So if I, if I redo the same argument that I did before, I won't go through the whole thing, I can say that db now is going to be mu naught over 4 pi times rho dv, that's my dq, times v-drift cross r hat over r squared. Okay. Now I can rewrite. So it turns out that the charge density times the velocity of the charges is the same as the current density. Okay. So the current density is the number of is it has units of amps per meter squared. So it counts. Uh, it really is the the charge um, the, the density of moving charges times their velocity. So it's the same as rho times v drift. Okay. And so I can rewrite this expression uh, for dB as mu naught over 4 pi um, J, which is the current density in the wire, or in whatever. This doesn't have to be a wire. It could be any volumetric distribution of moving charge. Uh, for example, we talked already about the, the dynamo of the Earth. So the, in, inside the center of the Earth, there is liquid metal. Um, it's, it's a good conductor. The current can flow throughout that liquid metal. And so there'll be a current density flowing at all points inside that metal. And this is how you calculate the field generated by it. So you could calculate the Earth's field using this if you knew the current density J everywhere inside the, the core. Um, so R hat has the same definition here. 
Okay. All right. So that's now the expression for uh, some volumetrically distributed current density J. This is how you calculate B. So if I write down, oops, if I write down now um, the magnetic field will be the integral then over this mu naught over 4 pi um, J cross R hat over R squared and then integrated over volume. All right, so I'm being somewhat arbitrary in writing my integrals. In this case here, there are three dimensions I integrate over, so it's really a triple integral, but we don't normally write it that way. I just write integral of dV. What I mean is integrate over that volume, so it'll be in practice an integral over dx, dy, dz uh, over that uh, bit of volume, and I'll have to integrate over the whole uh, volume of this um, wire here, okay, uh, in order to get the total magnetic field, say, generated over over here at this point, okay, um, I'll calculate B of R generated by this whole wire, um, this whole wire, okay, at this location, okay. All right, and then finally, um, you know, again, this is very abstract. I'll give you examples uh, later on. Finally, I can write down, uh, for example, if I have, instead of a, a, a volume that's carrying current, imagine I have a sheet of metal on which, you know, I'm, I'm carrying a current. Um, you can define now the, so I take a little bit of the, the sheet of metal that's carrying current, the charge, you know, the little bit of charge associated with that little area will be the charge density per unit area, so that I would usually write that as sigma, excuse me, times the area element, okay, and it turns out I can define a surface current, K, as sigma times V drift, okay, and so that has units of amps per meter, okay, and the way you think about that is if I take, you take my sheet of current here, if I draw a line here, then I can count the number of charges that cross that line per unit time and call that the current in this sheet. And it turns out that will be equal to K times this length here, L. Okay? All right, and so with that, I can write the magnetic field generated by this sheet of current using the following expression, mu naught over 4 pi um, K cross R hat over R squared uh, dA. And now I integrate over this sheet. And, you know, the uh, unspecified in all this is the location that I'm calculating B at, but that's inherent in these vectors, uh, in these distances, uh, R, the vector R hat and this, this distance length uh, R squared has in it um, uh, the location that I'm calculating the field at and the location of the current sheet is in there. Okay. All right. So we'll, this is all very abstract. I'm just int introducing these laws, which generically are called the Biot-Savar laws. So the one that's um, most frequently, if you hear Biot-Savar, what you usually mean um, is this expression here. Okay. And I'll do some examples in the next video, and we'll do some more in class where we use this to calculate the magnetic field so you'll understand how I do this integral, okay? So I'll stop there.